Hi, everyone. Hello. My name is Lauren. I'm the assistant events manager here. Um, we just want to welcome you all to Panassas and thank you all for coming. We are very honored to have James Rollins here on If I Believe Your Last Stop. <coughs> last Stop. You should feel very honored. Uh, we have been really excited to have him come in this week. Uh, we've heard from a lot of you. You guys have seemed very excited to have him in. You've been calling and emailing <laughs> and we absolutely love it when you do that. So um, we like to do really quick introductions here because we know that you guys are here to see the authors. So please join me in welcoming James Rollins. I've got a couple little uh, housekeeping uh, that you do. Is there a Pat Samore or Samore in the audience? No? Pat, 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 Pat? To get a free t shirt, I'll be Pat. <laughs> oh, Pat. We'll mail it to Pat. How about Matthew uh, Nevels? Matthew Nevels? Going once? Going twice? Okay, good. We'll mail that one too. That's all done. Again, okay, thank, thank you for coming out. This is my first time actually speaking in Nashville. So. Has anybody ever, by chance, heard me speak somewhere else? Where do you hear me speak? Uh, Atlanta. Okay, well, that, that's reasonable. So then, if I nobody else has heard me though, right? So that if I, I make something up, that <laughs> no one can call me on it. So I can pretty much make up whatever I want. Mm -hmm. I'm a fiction writer, so that goes part of the course. That's as far as you go. They've got it cool. taped down. <laughs> <laughs> Just the so I thought I, since it's my first time to Nashville, I'll introduce a little bit myself, a little bit about the book, and open up for Q and A. Uh, I like to leave a little time for Q and A because I'm always surprised anybody shows up at my signing. So hopefully, during this event, you will tell me why you're here. I know whenever I go to book signing, there's always this nagging question at the back of my mind about for that author. In fact, that book signing never gets answered. I never read them again or keep reading them again. So hopefully, I'll leave time for people to answer that. So how many people know I'm a veterinarian? We'll start, we'll start there. From the past, thank you. Uh, always wanted to be a veterinarian. Uh, still love animals, still love medicine, love, still love science. Uh, all the way from third grade, I got that assignment, you get somewhere in elementary school, what do you want to be when you grow up? I knew I wanted to be a veterinarian, but it was a point of moral dilemma for the third grade version of myself. I actively remember sitting in my little bedroom, desk in front of me, little blank sheet of paper. I knew I wanted to fill it out as, I want to be a veterinarian. You just know how to spell veterinarian. <laughs> I go fireman, I go doctor, I can fill out that little essay, go out and play. But I did the one thing that all third graders hate to do. I went out to get a dictionary and looked it up. That determined the third grade to be a veterinarian. But that story has significance, as you'll hear in just a moment, is let's skip forward to the first day of vet school. Class is seated, Dean walks in, gives an introductory speech to the new class. Ends the class with these chilling words, which I've heard you call her at some point during your, your childhood. Take out a sheet of paper, you're having your first pop quiz. It's a one question quiz. If you get it wrong, we're kicking you out of that school. Write down the word veterinarian. <laughs> Third grade, I was ready for that. Not all my classmates were. Like I said, that's this side of my brain. Loves animals, loves science, loves medicine. I also got this side of my brain. A little more wicked, a little more evil, a little more macabre. I've like this side of my face. I'm a brain for my family. I was raised with three brothers and three sisters. Do the math, seven kids. We were raised Polish, Roman Catholic. Keep the Polish flag in the window, you have to have at least six kids. <laughs> my mom had a spare. <laughs> Just in case something happened. But they were also my first audience. They were first targets for my storytelling. I was uh, I always wanted to convince my younger brothers and sisters of some outlandish scheme, some plot, some story. If tears were involved, all the better. I call it story time, I'm called lying to me. <laughs> but I thought I'd share just one of my little stories from my from my youth, something that sort of reflects on what I write today. Pretty much what I was doing in the past is pretty much what I'm writing today. So I thought I'd share just a little anecdote. Um, did I tell you the Ventilico story in Atlanta or was it Carrie's a Martian story? Remember? Uh, Martian story. Martian story. Yeah. I told the Ventilico story. I sort of ruined the punchline a little bit there with the Vitolocus revelation. Is that, again, we need to go back a little bit in time. I was 12 years old at this point. Picture me 12 years old. I was sharing a bedroom with my brother Chuck. He was nine years old. But one Christmas, I begged and pleaded to get a Vitolocus doll for Christmas. Uh, I thought it was going to become the world youngest Vitolocus, toured the world as the child prodigy of the Vitolocus of the world, showing my steam still throwing my voice. 
finally my parents caved in. They got me one of those ventriloquist dolls. It was uh, one of those Charlie McCarthy dolls. Anybody remember Charlie McCarthy? Pretty creepy in and of itself, that doll. <coughs> so it arrived and I got that. I was thrilled. Came with a little 45 RPM. You can listen to learn how to throw your voice. I listened to that diligently. I practiced for about three minutes and I realized very quickly, this is not a career for me. <laughs> I like to move my lips when I talk. This is not going to work out. So what am I going to do with this dumb doll that I've been making and pleading for months for? Gave it some considerable thought. Came up with an idea. Went to my bookshelf. Pulled out my copy of Lord of the Rings. An avid reader growing up. So of course I had Lord of the Rings on my shelf. Flipped to the back, last uh, Return of the King, flipped the end, there's a little appendix that has a lot of Elvish script and Nordic runes back there. Jotted down some of that, I put a piece of paper, crumbled the piece of paper, burnt the edges to match, folded the piece of paper, stuck it in the pocket of the doll. Later that night, I'm in my bed, Chuck's in his bed, doll's on the dresser. Chuck, there's something sticking out of the pocket of the doll. Can you see what that is? Ah, uh, right. Takes it out, all, all the folds it. Uh, I don't know, Jim, it's all old paper. It's got some scribbling on it, I can't make it out. Really, Chuck, that's, that's unusual, let me see that. You're right, Chuck. This paper is old. I'd almost say ancient. Uh -oh. And Chuck, I recognize this writing. You do? Yes. I might be able to translate it. <laughs> Who knows, it might be a lost incantation, it might be a secret of some treasure. Just give me a moment to do some research. I diligently did, did my research, I went back to my bookshelf, flipping books through the air, trying to find the right one. Of course, until I stumbled upon Lord of the Rings. Flip to the back, look at the writing. Look, Chuck, it's the same writing. It is. <laughs> I now know I can translate it. Do it. All right. <laughs> Diligently begin to do, to do the translation. Chuck, the first word has become clear. Beware. Well, that sounds promising. <laughs> Beware. After midnight, I rise and hunt for blood. <laughs> Jim, you think that's real? Looks real, doesn't it? <laughs> but just in case, let's fold that up and let's stick it in the pocket of the doll. Maybe you didn't know we read it. And as an extra precaution, let's make sure every single night before we go to bed, that creature is locked up. Reinforce it. Is a doll in the closet, Chuck? Yes, I think so. Make sure. If you close the closet door, so it clicks shut. We don't want it to push out and get us. All right. Reinforce it for a few weeks, and the fun begins. Get up, get up about 2 o'clock in the morning, take the doll out of the closet, see if I need my brother's blankets. <laughs> And just wait for morning. <laughs> Required changing a few sheets, but it was worth it. I left this side of my brain a little more wicked, a little more evil. And I grew up reading a lot more as so I threw gasoline on this side of my brain. So even though I career tracked being a vet, which I got my veterinary degree, so I sort of wanted to always write, so dabble with some short fiction that's now safely buried in my backyard, never to see the light of day. Started writing a little bit, had one book sell and another book sell, and my clients at my clinic began to be suspicious that something was going on. It was because of the posters in my lobby, get your cat spayed, get a free book. <laughs> it wasn't above that. So natural questions began to arise. Dr. Jimmy of the successful veterinary hospital, what's all this writing business? What's your long-term plan? What's your goal in life? I thought, well, aren't you nosy? <laughs> well, I'll try to answer that. I thought, well, you know, 15, 20 years now, veterinary medicine has been my paycheck. Writing was just a hobby. And that's really cool to flip that around, have writing be my paycheck and veterinary medicine be my hobby. And so I'm almost at that point right now. I still, uh, I still do some veterinary medicine. Some people think I've stopped, but I haven't. I still do some volunteer work. I work with a group that traps feral cats, wild cats. They bring them to the shelter over the course of a month. One Sunday every month, I spend about eight hours staying and during that collection. Once they're healed up, they're released for their trapped. Um, it's nice being on the bestseller list, but it's still pretty cool that I can do her cat in 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, now with my veterinary degrees, I just removed genitalia. <laughs> it's a hobby, like I said. <laughs> so that's the, 
basically a short answer how we met became an author. It was not a short path, it was a lot of rejection, not just a short story, but also that first novel. 49 different agents rejected that first novel. It was the 50th agent that agreed to represent Subterranean. It went through a lot of rejection. I don't mean kind rejections. I mean, there were some that were just somewhat, um, shall we say, honest. Hmm. These are just formal letters. You know, Dear Sir, Ma'am, hate your book, don't submit again. <laughs> they were even just like, maybe, they were just, you know, uh, form letters. But occasionally some kind editor might give you a little pat on the back, you know. We like that character, Jim. The rest of your novel still sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, as a new writer, this character was pretty good. You, that's a lot. I mean, that's a, you're crowing, you tattooed on your back, running up and down the aisles. So I got this rejection from a St. Martin's press editor. Again, it was a form rejection letter. But I had to, he's, he's written me a personal message on the back of the note, which is, takes the sting a little bit out of that rejection. It's just three words, though. This is unpublishable. <laughs> I thought, well, that's nice of him to reject me, but take the extra special time to kick me in the nuts beside <laughs> That's initiative. <laughs> so eventually the books came out, and I slowly sort of transitioned over to this new career. And, and if you want more details on the whole process, because there's more stories and there are more anecdotes, I could spend all night telling you about those, but I won't. I'm going to jump forward and talk about the new book I've got, and I'm going to open it up for some, some Q&A. I'm always a little stymied when it comes to talking about a new book, because I don't, I don't want to give too much away. But I, of course, need to tease you, because I want you to buy the book. And ideally read it. Actually, I don't really care if you read it. <laughs> Just buy it. So I came up with a scheme, this method of, of talking about a book. And, I, and I, I've done that for the last couple of months, and we do, I'm going to do it today. Uh, because I'm going to pose my discussion of I of God by answering the question, and if I don't answer it now, you're going to ask it during the Q&A. So I'm just going to get it out of the way. Because it's a question all authors hate to hear. You want to make an author cringe, walk up and ask them this question. Guess what that question is? I will wait for people guess. When's the next one coming out? Nope, not when's the next one coming out, but I'll tell that one. Who's your favorite character? Who's your favorite character? Nope. Everybody needs a movie. Nope. Who said that? I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's where you turn ideas from. Thank you. It's usually, again, I can usually guarantee it's going to be the first five questions. Someone's going to come up with the right one. Um, only once has a, at a book signing has it never come up. Big crowd question after question. About trickles of sweat are going down my back. No one's getting there. You no know, boxers or briefs. No, that's not the question I'll offer. Here to hear. Where do you get your ideas from? Uh, we don't like that question because we do not know. And we're afraid if you make us look at the process, it's going to evaporate, disappear, when we're going to lose that ability, and I don't have enough talent to afford that. <laughs> As you will see in just a moment, how ephemeral this whole process is in just a moment. I'm going to give you just an overview on how generally I, I come with ideas for books, and I'll talk specifically about this book. I've always got my antenna up for the next idea. I'm always looking for two things to build a novel around. I'm looking for a historical mystery, you know, a piece of history that ends in a question mark, something I can maybe solve in the pages of the novel. I'm also looking for a bit of that cutting edge science, and then it's what if or gee whiz or something I can explore to see where it's heading next, and then try some way to connect those two together. So my antenna is always up. I, I subscribe to about 24 different magazines from Smithsonian Institute, from the Smithsonian to National Geographic to Scientific American, on and on. I check it weekly, even that helps sometimes, oddly enough. Um, and so whenever I come across one of those pieces, I, I just cut it out. Cut out the article, because I don't want to tell magazines, I just cut the article I want. And I just throw in one of those uh, cardboard file boxes that everybody has them at home. Uh, it's messy, it's jumbled. You know, if I see something on television, John Note goes in there. If somebody tells me something, John in there. Or if somebody emails me something, goes in there. And you can imagine that one box has a tendency to fill up rather quickly. And I really just want to keep it to one box. I don't want one box to become two boxes, because then two boxes to become four boxes. You know, James Rollins on quarters. We don't want that. It's got to stay in one box. So to do that every now and then, I've got to dump that box out. But I've got to do a little clearing house. So I'll dump the box out in the middle of the living room floor, and I'll be looking through this, that, that pile of notes and, and articles, looking for things that either no longer interest me, or maybe another author is tackled so I can get rid of it. So I can keep it to one box. But what happens, which is the weird process, like I said, for the inexplic inexplicable, is that that piece of history and that piece of science 
will end up just on the floor next to each other in the middle of my living room floor. It's happening with my hands at the same time. And I look at the two of them, I see how they might connect. And sometimes I'll investigate and it'll dry up. A lot of times that becomes the story. I know where my own head, when I've ever picked those random two pieces together, because it just happened to be there at the same time, things become a story. It's weird. I'm afraid that someone steals my box out of my house. There goes my career. <laughs> <laughs> so how I'm going to frame my discussion of I have God, I'm just going to tell you two things that came out of that box that became this story. And this is a rather rare event in that both of those items, the history and the science, came from the same place. They came from one trip to Chicago, which never happened. Usually it's like very weird things like this. I watched National Geographic four years ago, and this new piece of cutting edge science I just learned from the Discovery Channel, and then I connected. So this is weird that one trip generated both ideas. What happened? So we'll talk about the science just for a moment first, then we'll talk about the history. I'm not going to tell you how the two connect. I'm not going to tell you how those students connect because there's a cash register somewhere in this building. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to tell you what they are, and then you can just fill the blanks how you like. I had a personal invitation to do a private tour to the Fermi Lab in Chicago. It's a national particle lab outside of Chicago. A very fascinating place to do high particle physics, work with neutrinos that are involved in the discovery of the God particle. Very cool stuff. So it's very cool to have this tour of the facility, got to see where they were building the, the dark energy camera array, and some cool stuff like that. But at lunchtime, I'm sitting at the table, a bunch of physicists and me, <laughs> and I posed a question to this table since I had their attention for a moment. Uh, and I asked them a question I ask a lot of scientists whenever I have a chance to, to face them face to face. I said, tell me something about your research that keeps you up at night, that scares you. That question has generated a lot of good ideas. And they did. It was a very disconcerting lunch, shall we say. But it, was, it gave me the beginning of a story that became a story. And this is what one gentleman told me. And this has come out in the news later on, but this was news to me at the time. He said, we believe now, as physicists, that nothing is real. That everything is just lights and shadows and very little substance. That the universe probably is just a hologram. Just a projection. And I go, of course, you know, being the inquisitive research slash novelist that I am, I had to deeply challenge this notion from the synthesist, so I said, really? That was about the extent of it. <laughs> said, yes, you know, we'll pretty much accept that as a fact. And uh, he, he tried to explain why. I said, can you make it simpler? No, simpler than that. <laughs> actually, by the way, just as a side note, they're, at Fermilab, they're building a device, it's an infermometer, if I can pronounce that correctly, what's called a hollow meter. They're developing this right now as we speak, and they're going to turn it on shortly. What this device is going to do is they're going to test to see if indeed we're living in a hologram. So that should probably prove that shortly. But this is the example, this is the simplification that sort of makes a little bit of sense to me of how the world might just be lights and shadows of very little substance. And I'm going to share with that, share that little fact with you today. But to do that, we need a volunteer from the audience. Somebody brave. Okay, but if you pull their hand up for just a second longer, you have to tell me your weight. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Let me put their hands up really quick. Sir, if I could just grab you. You look substantial. Well, thank you. <laughs> I know my weight. Yes, and I need you up front. Thank you for volunteering. Yeah. And you need this? Bob. 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 About how much do you weigh again? 205 pounds. 205. So Bob is 205 pounds. He looks solid, right? He looks real. I can do this. See? He moves even when I poke him a little bit. But is, it, is he real? Let's examine Bob in a little greater detail, shall we? <laughs> we'll get even worse in just a second, sir. <laughs> we know Bob is made of atoms, as all we all. You know, atoms have a very simple structure. We've all learned in basic science, a nucleus surrounded by circulating shells of electrons. So of course, you can well imagine that there's some distance between those electrons that are orbiting around the nucleus and the nucleus itself. There's some, some space. Shall we say so there's some dead space, or in Bob's case, some hot air in there. 
But let's say we just made a, a little experiment and we just took all of that dead air out of that atom. We just emptied the atom of its dead air, just collapsed those electrons down to the nucleus, just got to the core matter that makes up Bob's 205 pounds. Just squash Bob down, let's shrink him down, let's get all that hot air out of Bob, which we know there's plenty of. It. We'll find out how much of hot air there is in Bob in just a second. How small do you think Bob's 205 pounds would collapse down to? Can anybody guess? Anybody want to guess how small that might be? Ounces. Um, well, the size of oh, the volume. Um, size of them. 205 pounds. 205 pounds. Oh, the size of a ping pong ball. What's that? Ping pong ball. Ping pong ball. A little smaller. Greater rise, a little smaller. A few nanometers. What was that? A few nanometers. A little smaller than that. <laughs> let's talk about that. Let's shrink Bob down, shall we? Get all the hot air out of him. Let's just not stop. Let's not pick on Bob. Let's shrink everybody out of this room. Let's not even stop there. Let's take everybody on the planet. Shrink them all down. Let's not even stop there. Let's go all the way to the past. Every human being that was ever born on this planet Earth, past to present, let's shrink them down. All of us, in our totality, would fit inside a baseball. That's how little of us is actually solid matter. Everything else is just void. Empty space is energy, it's lights and shadows. So though Bob might seem real, he's not. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> Aww. <laughs> 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 there's details like that, I love that where you, know, where you can sort of get an idea of what they're talking about. They talk about these weird concepts of holograms and all this weird stuff. I try to look at how can we get that down to a practical thought? Try to sprinkle that throughout the novel. And that whole wrong table discussion about that got weirder and stranger, and there's a lot of things like that that are in this novel that I'm not going to share with you for obvious reasons. So we're going to then just going to leave that. That's the science. That's what uh, I learned from Fermilab when we visited Chicago. Like I said, it was that same visit that gave me the history. Is that a, I had a couple of days left after Fermilab, so I decided to visit the Field Museum outside of Chicago. It's a natural history museum, great museum. And they're doing an exhibit on Genghis Khan. Now, I've already been fascinated by Genghis Khan. As a matter of fact, in that box, I was there's already some tidbits from some place or other about Genghis Khan. Specifically, because there's, I'm always looking at this for a historical mystery. And there's one big mystery surrounding, this, surrounding Genghis Khan. No one knows where he was buried. No one knows where his tomb is. Genghis Khan lived during the 13th century, Mongol warlord, conquered most of the known world, Vast wealth tra tra channeled into, a, or traveled into a Mongolia and vanished. It was buried with, with uh, Genghis Khan. When Genghis Khan was buried, everybody involved with the burial, which is a huge procession involved in his burial, was either murdered or they committed suicide to keep his grave secret. Now, archaeologists believe they're close to finding his grave. They, they have sort of been narrowing it down a little bit, so they're probably actually pretty close to finding it. It should be spectacular finding them to do. Vast treasures will probably change a lot what we know about history. So of course, as a, as a novice thriller writer, I think it would be really cool to build a structure around his hunt for the lost tomb of Genghis Khan. So that was in there. And I went to this exhibit thinking, well, maybe there's something more. Maybe something that will even intrigue me more about this. And so I, I went to this, and I, I learned a couple of details. I'll explain this in a moment. But I got intrigued enough that I'm going to write a story about Genghis Khan. But I needed some help. I've never been to Mongolia. Didn't have time to travel to Mongolia. So I thought, somebody's going to just have to tell me about Mongolia. I did that this was sandstorm. I've never been to Oman. But I had some assistance on the, on the ground. So I contacted somebody that was selling Mongolian products to the US, contacted the website, found out who, was, who this individual was, contacted him via email, to him an author working on this, would you help me be my eyes and ears in Mongolia? So I get some details, make sure I get everything correct. He said, sure, but what are you writing about Mongolia? Are you going to be derogatory? Oh, so not at all. You travel, I'll be very intrigued about your culture and history. But I'm basically going to do this treasure hunt for Genghis Khan's lost tomb. And he goes, well, you can't do that. <laughs> like, what do you mean I can't do that? He says, well, here in Mongolia, the Mongol people believe, and it's a very firm legend out here, is that if, Mo if Genghis Khan's tomb is ever discovered and ever opened, it will mark the end of the world. And I'm going, Check mark. <laughs> I'm going to make that happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But 